Hi, and welcome back to Dorky Docs, where the feature of this video is type 2 diabetes. Let's start off with the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. This really depends on whether the patient is symptomatic or not, or if we're using blood glucose levels or HbA1c levels. A patient is deemed symptomatic when they are polyuric, polydipsic, or polyphagic, or in simple terms, excessive urination, excessive thirst, or excessive appetite. If we're using blood glucose, then the diagnostic criteria is a fasting blood glucose of above 7, or a random blood glucose of above 11.1, or after an oral glucose tolerance test. If the patient, however, is asymptomatic, then these results would need to be repeated to ensure the diagnosis. If you're using an HbA1c, then a value greater than 6.5% is diagnostic, but again, asymptomatic patients ought to have this repeated. It's worth noting that there's a wide range of conditions such as CKD, hemolytic anemia and severe iron deficiency anemias that would render the HbA1c invalid. We should also touch on impaired fasting glucose and impaired glucose tolerance. Impaired fasting glucose is defined as a fasting glucose of between 6.1 and 7.9, whereas an impaired glucose tolerance is a fasting glucose of less than 7, but between 7.8 and 11.1, two hours after an oral glucose tolerance test. It is also considered that both impaired fasting glucose, where there is a hepatic insulin resistance, and impaired glucose tolerance, where there is a muscular insulin resistance, come under the umbrella of prediabetes, which these tend to be patients with an HbA1c between 6.0% and 6.4%, or a fasting glucose of 6.1-6.9. These patients, particularly impaired glucose tolerance, are likely to go on to develop type 2 diabetes and are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease and thus lifestyle modification, particularly in the terms of exercise, weight loss and diet control, is recommended and there is actually some support of using metformin at this stage. If done successfully, the diagnosis of prediabetes can theoretically be reversed. But the main stray of diabetes, and what you really need to know for your exams, is its management. We start off, as always, with dietary advice and conservative management, including exercise prescription, alcohol and smoking assessments. Additionally, diabetic patients should get their annual flu jab as well as annual diabetic assessments and retinal screening. After lifestyle modification, the first line medication is metformin, with the target HbA1c being 6.5%. If, however, despite optimising all of your lifestyle issues and your metformin dose, the HbA1c climbs above 7.5%, then you can consider double therapy by adding in one of the following, either a sulfonylurea, glyptins, glitazones, and SGL2 inhibitors. Despite this, if the HbA1c continues to rise to 7.5%, then a third agent would need to be considered. Failing this, discussion about the initiation of insulin might be needed. If, however, the patient couldn't tolerate metformin at the onset, initiation with either a sulfonylurea, glyptin, glitazone would need to be considered, with the second step being dual therapy of one of the four above mentioned medications. Failing this, insulin may be needed. There is, however, another medication, a GLP-1 mimic or glucagon-like peptide-1 mimic that could also be used, particularly if triple therapy isn't effective or if insulin really isn't that preferable. This is most useful for patients who have a BMI above 35 with psychological or physical problems secondary to obesity or those with a BMI of less than 35 but not able to take insulin. This is ideal in aiding weight loss. There are a few other things you need to be aware of, particularly with monitoring diabetes. NICE recommend that HbA1c should be checked every 3-6 to six months until it's stable, and then every 6 months after that. But elderly patients, particularly if they're frail, don't actually need to have such a tight control of their diabetes because it could cause more harm than good. We need to also be aware of some of the common side effects of these medications, with metformin commonly causing gastrointestinal upset and lactic acidosis, sulfonylurea is causing hypos, weight gain and cholestatic liver damage, glitazone is typically causing weight gain and water retention, with an increased risk of osteoporosis and heart failure, and it's a risk factor for bladder cancers. Gliptins can cause pancreatitis, where SGL2 inhibitors cause frequent UTIs and in some cases euglycemic DKA. And finally, with regards to diabetes, we should also be aware of cardiovascular risk modification. In terms of blood pressure, the targets are 140 over 90, or 135 over 85, it's home blood pressure. But if the patients are above 80 years old, the target is slightly looser, with a target blood pressure of 150 over 90, 
with 145 over 85 at home. It should be noted that ACE inhibitors are typically first line for type 2 diabetics, regardless of age or ethnicity. In terms of lipids, atorvastatin 20mg should be initiated in any diabetic with a Q risk score above 10%, with this being up titrated if the non-HDL hasn't fallen at least 40%. As always, smoking cessation, weight loss management and alcohol control is also important. So there we have it, a quick overview of type 2 diabetes and its management. If you like this video, be sure to like and subscribe and hit the notifications button so you don't miss amazing revision content here on offer. But if you've got any questions or requests, go on and leave a comment below. But otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.